Okay, thank you, Jeremy. Um, as Jeremy told you all, I am a former teen librarian, currently a mostly stay-at-home mom, but all of this was uh, very helpful to me during my tenure as a teen librarian, so hopefully nothing much has changed in the mm, six months since I left my position. Um, there is contact information on this first slide here, and I will show that information again on the final slide, so you don't need to worry about copying it down right now. Um, and, you know, just as a quick basis, what are we going to cover today? We're going to talk about recruiting volunteers, the difference um, summer versus school year volunteers, how it is that you can train them, how do you schedule volunteers, how do you track the teens who are volunteering for you, what are some modes of communication that work really well, how do you show your appreciation, and how do you retain those volunteers. Now, I want to make sure to let you all know, don't bother with notes. Um, I am going to be sharing everything that I'm showing you today and more. There's a Google Drive folder with everything that you need. All you need to do as far as note taking is take a screenshot or write down this URL, bit.ly volunteer webinar. That's all you need, bit.ly slash volunteer webinar, and it will give you every single document that I discuss and some more. All right, so we're going to get started with volunteer recruitment. One obvious thing is posters in the library, but you need to remember that not all of the teens in your community actually come into the library on a regular basis, so you can't just depend on that. I would recommend sending posters in to school librarians and teachers with whom you've started a relationship. Um, if you haven't yet, start getting your in to those schools because it is very helpful to have school librarians and teachers who are willing to pass along the message for you. You can post an ad in the library newsletter. I don't know too many teens who are actually reading the library newsletter on their own, but you do get the involved parents who know that their teen wants to volunteer or who know that their teen needs to volunteer for a club that they belong to or to start on their college resume. An announcement on your library website is very helpful, especially if you have a teen page of your website. Um, at East Greenbush, I actually created a sub page of the teen website that was just about volunteers, and I would make announcements on there about when there were trainings, and I would have our applications and everything available as well. Social media posts, it totally depends on what the teens in your community are into. I know that you know, back in the day I started out with MySpace <laughs> um, and that was, you know, very quickly gone over and we went over to Facebook instead. Um, there are some teens who don't use Facebook anymore. There are some who use nothing but Facebook. You have to really poll your own teens at your library to see which social media would do best for reaching out to them. Discuss it in your teen advisory group. And if you don't yet have a teen advisory group, I recommend you start one because as with it and as cool as you think you might be, you will sometimes realize, oh, I had no idea that, say, for example, teens don't really like duct tape crafts anymore in East Greenbush. I had no idea. I tried to do a duct tape craft and they all looked at me like I had three heads. So my teen advisory group gave me some other crafts that they were more interested in. Talk to regulars in your teen area. If you've got a kid that you're seeing on a regular basis and you are not familiar with them only because they are a troublemaker, it might be a good idea to reach out to them and say, hey, we've got volunteer needs at the library. Would you be interested? And just talking to them one-on-one -on -one sometimes can open the door. Contact local service groups. If you have a school with a key club in your service area, that's an excellent way to get in touch with them. There's also um, Sunday schools and Taekwondo lessons, and there's so many different places that require kids to have volunteer experience. And so if you know what some of those different groups are in your area, reach out to them, let them know when your trainings will be. School visits are key. For me, I really only ever was able to make it in to school visits at the end of the year. Everything was just so busy. The teachers didn't have a lot of time to give me, but they would guarantee me a visit for summer reading because they wanted me to help book talk the stories they wanted the kids to read over the summer. And so that was a good place to interject with a little bit of volunteer recruitment as well. Sending postcards to previous volunteers is something that I actually um, 
I got that idea while I was out presenting about volunteers. Someone said, oh, do you ever advertise directly to your previous volunteers? I had never thought of it, but it's a fantastic idea. And teens nowadays don't really get a lot of mail actual mail. Um, everything's always virtual and digital and so as nice as it is to see something on Facebook where they might already be, it apparently it's really special to get a postcard in the mail from Miss Chrissy saying, hey, we really liked having you as a volunteer last year. Make sure you save the date for this year's training. Summer versus school year. There's a big difference and people always ask, you know, what's so different about summer volunteers? Well, everything pretty much to put a point on it. Um, the schedule is much more filled with volunteers in the summertime. We need constant coverage at the East Greenbush Library. We needed volunteers much more during the summer than we did during the school year because every hour that we were open, we required volunteers to help. Summer volunteer jobs are also different. Um, for us, we had the kids um, running, I'm sorry, the teens were running the kids' summer reading headquarters. And so when you've got over 700 kids signed up for summer reading and three full-time librarians and four part-time librarians, it's really difficult to have the librarians run the show. We were very fortunate that we had a great group of volunteers and that we were able to train them so that they could run the summer reading headquarters for us. They also helped a lot with the kids' programs, but we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Paging and straightening the children's room is key during the summertime. There are always little whirlwinds coming through and you know the little kids who want to help and put things away and have no idea where it really goes. So having those extra volunteers wandering around the room and just looking for things that look out of place and putting them where they truly belong is priceless. We do formal training sessions for summer versus school year, um, mostly because everything is so standard in the summer. If there's a standard job, we figured a standard training would make more sense. So we did do it as a drop-in training, um, and that way we found that it's less stressful for the volunteers who are unsure if they want to volunteer. This way they could say, okay, I'm going to show up, I'm going to see what it's all about, but I don't have to give any information until the very end of the training. I would always joke with the teens who didn't necessarily know me yet. I'd say, you know, it's okay. I don't know who you are. I can't stalk you down. If you don't turn in your application until the end of training and you decide you don't want to turn it in at all, you're free to go. I'll never be able to find you. Um, and some of them thought that was really funny. And Actually, a couple of them told me that was the reason they ended up showing up because they didn't want to make a commitment before they even saw the training and before they even knew what it was that was going to be expected of them. However, it's slightly more stressful for the trainer because you don't necessarily know how many tables and chairs to have out, how many pens and papers and all that kind of stuff. So you really have to plan for a deluge of kids and then you know hope that you really get enough. There is an application that we required, um, and the application I'm just going to bring up really quick and show you. This is, again, one of those things <clears throat> that's available on the Google Drive, but we asked them to turn it in at the volunteer training, at the end of training. Um, they would put in basic information. I always made it a point during the training to tell them emergency contact name does not mean mom or dad or grandma, I need to have an actual name because God forbid you fall and break your arm or you're sick and you need a ride home, I don't want to call and say, hi, is grandma there? I want to be able to call and say, hi, is Susie there? I'm calling on behalf of my volunteer, Tim. He's not feeling well. He needs a ride home. It's kind of awkward to call and ask for grandma. And they always, you know, understood and gave me real names after the fact, but I made sure to actually check that when I'm at training because lots of them did say mom, dad, grandma, grandpa. Um, I asked the volunteers, you know, if they thought they had any special skills or previous experiences that would help them. And that wasn't so much because I would turn them down if they didn't have any things or, you know, why would they like to be a volunteer. It's not like they were going to fail this application. It was more so if they said, you know, I babysit all the time or I work as a summer camp counselor. I could say, all right, these are the kids that might be my go-to kids. If I really am struggling to find someone to help with a program, I'll have this list of kids available to me where I can say, okay, A, B, C, 
these are the kids I'm going to and I'm going to ask them for a little bit of extra help. I always make it a point to ask about their favorite book of the year um, and some of them will say, oh I didn't read anything except for school assignments, but some of them have given me titles of books I hadn't heard of and that I needed to be aware of and so it was really exciting to get to find out some new books that the teens were really into. The other part on here that I recommend having um, is this little note on the bottom where you reserve the right to remove them from the program. I always tell them, you know, you're not getting paid, but you can still get fired. You need to understand that there are certain expectations of your behavior and that you need to follow the rules and responsibilities of the volunteer program or we can dismiss you. And I bring that up on the application, I bring that up during the training, I bring it up in the FAQ that I hand out after the training because I want these teens to understand this is a serious thing. It's like a job, they're just not getting paid. Um, and you will probably notice also that I had different levels of volunteering. This was to try and encourage more teens to sign up for more hours because when we had um, just a minimum requirement of 16 hours, a lot of the kids would drop out. As soon as they hit their 16, they would stop. The, toward the end of my tenure at East Greenbush, we had problems where too many kids were trying for super uber volunteer, and they were really just fighting for as many hours as possible and making it difficult for some of the less established volunteers, some of the newer volunteers to really get in there and get some experience. So you'll have to gauge how you want to run that based on how many volunteers you need and how many volunteers actually apply. I do recommend that they complete their applications ahead of time, especially because in this day and age, everybody's got cell phones and numbers are on cell phones, not memorized in your head. And I ask them to have their cell phones put away during training. So it's going to be really difficult for them to fill out some of that information if they don't know it already. Um, they are available online. I make them available for pickup in the children's room so they can come ahead of time. You know, if they don't have a printer at home, if their printer is not working, if they don't have internet for whatever reason, and I wouldn't charge them for the printout of the application because they're doing us a favor by applying. We did make it a point to vary our trainings for availability. We wanted to make sure that we had both afternoon and evening trainings because for some kids, transportation is truly an issue and it's more convenient for them to get on the bus that comes from the middle school or the high school to our library. We were very fortunate that we had a district that would transport kids directly to us as long as they had a note from their parents. However, there were also kids who participated in after school activities and, you know, sports clubs and things. So it was really difficult for them to make an afternoon training. So we would make sure we had an evening training availability as well. Um, and we also wanted to have a weekend training. After a few years, I realized what about those kids that are really just super booked during the school year? but they will be available during the summer. So we opened it up and we did a Saturday afternoon training as well so that even if they had school concerts or sports interfering with their afternoon and evening availability, they could still get in for that weekend and then they'd be available for us during the summer. <clears throat> Locked doors. This one um, kind of throws people for a loop when I first tell them about it, but I always lock the doors at my training. And I, I tell the volunteers, you know, it helps to make a statement about being on time for shifts. Now, I do advertise that the doors will be locked at the beginning of training when I put it in the newsletter, when I put it on the posters. Everywhere that I advertise, I say the doors lock at 1 o'clock, so be there on time, something along those lines. Um, it prevents sneak-ins at the very end. That's the main reason why I do it, because the first year, that I was in charge of the volunteer program, I had this kid come in for one of his shifts, it was his very first shift, and he didn't seem to know anything of what he needed to know, and I was just getting very frustrated, and I was trying to keep my calm, and I asked him, you know, what were you doing during the training? How did you not know about any of this? And he said, oh, well, I showed up right at the very end. I, I showed up in time to turn in my application. That's pretty much when I got there. And that's when I said to myself, that can't happen anymore. I can't have a kid who only makes it there in time to turn in the application. They need to be there for the training. And because we tended to have large groups of kids at training, it made it easier for me to just have the door locked. And that way they couldn't sneak in and I didn't have to monitor the door the whole time. I could just pay attention to the training. 
I do a slideshow with lots of visuals, and I'm just going to switch over to the slideshow that I do for the volunteers only for a few of the visual slides. If we had longer, I might go through the whole thing, but the entire slideshow is available on the Google Drive, so you can look through and see what it is that I typically did. I wanted to show them especially though, how was it that you would use the Google Calendar? Because we like to use Google Calendar for ease of checking the schedule, not so much signing up. The teens didn't have access to sign up for shifts online, but they could look at the shifts online and they could see from home what have they already signed up for or what is still available. Um, and that way we didn't have to have them constantly calling into the library or they didn't have to drop by the library to look at the paper calendar any longer. So I would always tell them, you know, make sure you select the week so that you're looking at a, um, a better view where you can actually see more detail. And then at the top left, I always made an extra little box that shows when can you sign up for that week. There's no confusion about when they can sign up for shifts if it specifically says, okay, the week of the 29th, you can start signing up for that week at training. Until you attend training, you can't sign up for that shift. And for our summer reading program, we always did two weeks in advance. And that way, volunteers would know what their schedule was going to be, or at least have a better idea of what their schedule was going to be. Usually, kids aren't always uh, on top of what their whole summer is going to look like. They don't always plan ahead as much as adults. And so we didn't expect them to plan very far ahead for us. Now, when they're looking at the Google Calendar, there are two different ways that things will show up. It'll show up as just the name of the shift or with a volunteer's name and the name of the shift. Uh, we did have only a last initial as opposed to the entire last name just to keep some anonymity available. Um, since we were making this a viewable with link kind of calendar on Google, uh, it had to be publicly available. I'm pretty sure they haven't changed their policies on that. Last I checked, you have to have your Google Calendar publicly searchable in order for it to have a URL that you can share with people. Otherwise, you're going to have to share individually with each and every email that you want to have access to it. So I really don't recommend that, but we'll talk more about that later. I always told them if there's not a volunteer's name before the description of the job, the slot should be available for you to sign up. Granted, if they check it three hours before they call me, it might be signed up for by then. But if they're looking at it in real time on the phone with a librarian and they're trying to sign up for shifts, this is a really easy way for us to look at the same thing at the same time. They can also track their hours online. I made a viewable only um, Google spreadsheet for them to look at and this way they could look through and they could see you know what was their goal what is their current level how many total hours have they worked and they could see in each of the weeks where is it that I've given them hours so they can tell me Chrissy I think you made a mistake I was supposed to have six hours on that last week of June but it looks like you only gave me five hours and so we can go back through and we can look and check things I always reminded them though make sure you look for the last updated date at the top there because if you call me freaking out that your hours aren't showing but the last update was before that shift it's obviously not going to be on there yet I do have a sub list that I hold them accountable for and I give them suggested scripts because not everyone has great phone etiquette yet when they're in middle and high school. A lot of kids don't even speak on the phone as much as they used to when I was growing up. It's a lot of texting and emailing now. So I gave them an actual script for how they might go about finding a substitute. And then also a suggested script for notifying the librarians of the substitute. And I would show them this at the training so you know you don't need to freak out. Even if you have no idea what to say, we will give you a sentence, you fill in the blanks, and we will go from there. We also showed them the registration cards ahead of time because if they're in charge of helping the kids sign up for summer reading, we want them to know what it is that the kids are going to be expected to fill out. Um, there's a few questions that tend to come up a lot, like 
the age and the grade. I mean, we put entering grade, so hopefully the parents and the children will notice that if you're starting kindergarten this year, then you would circle kindergarten. If you're going into second grade, you would circle second grade. But some kids ask, is it the grade I just finished? or the grade that I'm about to start? And the teens need to know the answer to that question. Same thing with the school. If someone's transferring between schools, what school are you going to attend? And age is a really big one for a lot of little kids. They really look forward to being the next age. You know, I'm gonna be eight in the middle of August. Can I put eight or do I have to put seven? And I always told the teens, you know, be kind about it. Be gentle about it. Ask them if their birthday is during summer reading. If their birthday is during summer reading, they can jump themselves ahead. If their birthday is not till September or October, they're going to have to wait to put their next age on there. So that's the end of the visuals, um, but there's certainly a lot more to that actual slideshow. We do a lot of role playing at the volunteer trainings because some of these kids are very shy and they don't really know how to do any kind of customer service interaction. So it's kind of like when you're in library school and you practice your reference interviews. We get someone to come up and I'll pretend to be the volunteer and they'll pretend to be a kid who's signing up for summer reading. And so then I go through helping them fill out the form and giving them their reading record and explaining to them about coming in to check up for prizes. Then that person will go sit down and someone else can come up and volunteer to be the volunteer and someone else volunteers to be a kid. And we go through it a few times just so they can get an idea of the way that this plays out. There is a handout that I give at the end of training with frequently asked questions. It is for the kids, but it is also for their parents. I found that a lot of parents really wanted to come into the training and sit with their teens. And I would remind them, this is your teen's volunteer position. It is not your volunteer position. So I really need the teen to be responsible enough to sit through the training on their own and to take their own notes if they feel that they need to take notes. I don't want them to feel like they can just lean on you and you can do it for them still. But because the parents want to know what's going on and they are responsible for helping get their kids to the library for their volunteer shifts, I do think it's important to keep them apprised of what's going on, basic reminders of behavior and what kind of duties they have. So we give them this FAQ and it reminds them of the behaviors that are expected. It gives them contact information. I like to leave it with blank bitlies, um, and that way I can print this out, and if there's leftovers at the end of the year, I can save them for next year. I'm that crunchy granola person who doesn't like to waste paper. Um, but I will say bitly is going to be probably your best friend as far as handing out all of these different URLs that kids need. If you don't have a bitly account yet, please do yourself a favor and sign up for one because you can create custom URLs. So the calendar schedule, for example, I would probably, I think last year I had 2015 SVT calendar, so summer volunteer calendar. And then every year you can just change the year on it and it'll still look right. Or you could even just do, you know, 2015 EGVT and that way, you know, it's East Greenwich volunteer because there's going to be a bunch of you who are probably going to be using Bitly and you don't want to all have to compete for the URL so maybe customize it to your library's name. Inside of here I do make it a point to mention in the training and in the FAQ that we don't want forced volunteering. We don't want kids who are voluntold by their parents to come in and help us out. Uh, we want volunteers who want to be there because the, there's nothing worse than a kid who shows up because they're forced and who's really reluctant to follow any kind of direction from you and very grouchy and very grumpy the entire time. They're not the volunteer you want to help you out. So I do make it a point to tell the kids, you know, if you really don't want to be here, I'll be your advocate. Let your parent or guardian know that we need to talk after training and we can sit down and we can have a discussion about that. All right, so after the FAQs, I go ahead and I collect their applications. I do it after training, so they already know what they're getting into, they already know they're excited to be a volunteer, they already know what kinds of things they're gonna be helping out with during the summer, then they hand in their applications and we go take a little tour of the library and show them the area where they'll be working. 
this is their chance to politely decline. They can just walk away and take their application with them. Also, the parents and guardians should be there for pickup if the applications are missing any information. You can just ask them, you know, hang out with me at the end of training when your mom or dad or grandma or whoever comes to look for you to pick you up. Ask them to come in here so we can get the rest of this phone number because you forgot to write down the phone number or whatever it is that we're missing. You know, for summer reading, you know, so it really walks them through it very clearly. Teens usually work to meet your level of expectation, so set them high. If you don't expect a lot from your volunteers, if you just expect them to basically show up and sit there, they'll know that and they're not really going to strive for more. But if you tell them, you know, this is like a job, I expect you to come in on time, I expect you to help out, I expect you to be friendly to people, they're going to really rise to the occasion. Summer volunteer scheduling can be a little bit harrowing. Um, it depends on how much you're going to be using your volunteer. So, so first figure out how are you going to use them, when are you going to use them. Are they going to run your summer reading club? If so, I recommend two volunteers per shift and I recommend changing your shift every two hours. That way they don't get too burned out and they have someone with them in case someone needs to go to the bathroom or go get a drink or just wants to take a step out of the room for a minute. Um, or even if it's just really busy, then it doesn't feel so overwhelming to have one person who feels like they're responsible for everybody in the room. Helping at programs, I recommend a 30-minute window before and after your program. So say, for example, you've got a craft program that's going to be at 2 p.m. I would recommend having your volunteer show up at 1.30 and stay till 3.30. That way they can help you set up from 1.30 until 2.00. From 2 o'clock until 3 o'clock, they can help out at your craft program. And then from uh, 3 p.m. to 3.30, they could help you with the cleanup after your program. Paging and data entry, um, I'd say one to two hours at most. And as far as paging is concerned, I used to actually give a quiz just to see if kids knew Dewey order. You know, so I would um, come up with a sample quiz of some DVDs and some books. I would do both fiction and nonfiction and just have them try and put them in order. You could do a practical test and bring in actual materials. You can do it on paper, whatever you are comfortable with. You could honestly just train them on the spot for that if you're comfortable with it. But I knew that there were a lot of teens who weren't really the best with their alphabetical order and so I could kind of weed them out with a quiz. Um, data entry, this is a great way to save yourself and to save your interns a lot of time over the summer. If you are fortunate enough to have an intern from an iSchool, I would recommend using them to help with planning and implementing your programs instead of using them for data entry. New York State does have a contract currently with Evanced where you can sign up for the summer reader and um, you know, all the kids' information can be put into that.
blue. And I looked at it and I said, oh, okay, <laughs> this is very different. Um, so make sure you look at the staff side and the volunteer side before you explain anything to them. And um, have abbreviations that make things easier. For headquarters, we always used HQ. For Valentin page, you could use VTP, for example. I mean, you can come up with anything that you think would work well for your library, any names that you come up with. Summer Valentin tracking is very important because you want to make sure that kids are meeting the minimum requirement. And if they're going above and beyond, you want to be able to recognize them for what they've done. It's another great use of Google Drive. Um, it's easy to share, but I share view only. I am adamant about view only because you don't want the teens to go in and accidentally delete your data or, heaven forbid, you have someone who just wants to go in and you know tweak their numbers a little bit. If you make it view only, you give them a link where they can look at it and then they can get in touch with you. They can help keep you honest if you make any mistakes, but they can't make any mistakes for you. You can avoid math errors with formulas. Um, I am a big proponent of putting a formula into one file or into one cell and then dragging it down the whole rest of the line so that it can do everything for me. And I always include a last updated field. Again, like I said earlier, you don't want a teen to call you hysterical about you're missing four of their hours, but really you're not missing anything because you just haven't updated with that latest week yet. I recommend keeping it all on one tab, even though we are very good as information professionals at going between different tabs and navigating through spreadsheets. Some of the teens, some of their parents are not as familiar with using spreadsheets and it can be very confusing. So make it as simple as possible to share with other people. There's less to explain to them and it's easier to scroll across when you're doing your data entry as well. Color coding each month helps to separate the columns visually. I prefer to do that. I'm very OCD. I like color coding. If you don't care, feel free not to do it, but for me, it was easier in my mind to say, okay, I want to know just how many hours were volunteered in August or how many hours were volunteered in July, and I could look and I could say, okay, all the blue was the July and all the orange was August. Communication is key, especially when you have a lot of volunteers to work with. Gmail is awesome. I am a Google fangirl, apparently. I use all the different Gmail and Google Drive products on a regular basis. Um, but Gmail is awesome because you can add all of your volunteers to your contacts, and then you can create a group. There is a tutorial on Drive for people who are not familiar with Gmail. Um, and it's fairly simple. But just in case you're not familiar, that tutorial walks you through it step by step. And basically, you can email everybody at the same time without having to open up your contacts and click select all or, you know, go through and click just a few here or there. You can say, you know, this group is my Valentin pages. This group is my summer Valentines. This group is the Valentines who are graduating at the end of summer. Whatever groups you want to create that will help you better communicate with your volunteer group, you can say, I'm going to contact just these people. And once you've got the group named and it's in your contacts, you can type just the group name and it will fill in everything else for you. Try not to email more than twice a week, um, not only because it gets confusing, but also because, you know, you want them to pay attention. You don't want them to tune out. So I tend to go with special announcements and begging for help if there's too many empty shifts. Uh, I usually have to beg for help at the end of summer, not so much in the beginning. Everyone's really gung-ho in the beginning. Everyone's excited. But once people start meeting their minimum requirements, things start to fall off, so I might have say, okay, I need help for our finale. Are there any volunteers out there who want some extra help? Um, and that way I can get more people. Don't forget to use BCC. I, I just shudder every time I get an email from one of my children's teachers and it has everybody's email listed in there. And yes, I have nothing to hide and I guess I don't really truly care if my children's classmates can email me or whatever, but it's just, it's more professional and it's better for privacy concerns. Libraries are all about information and privacy. Um, use that blank, or I'm sorry, blind carbon copy field. So just go into the BCC and put all the emails in there. 
that way you can send it to all your volunteers at the same time and none of your volunteers are going to be able to lift any emails from people who wouldn't otherwise want them to have it. No email to sign up for shifts was one of my big rules after the first couple of years. Um, originally, I did allow teens to use email to sign up for shifts, but I found there were a few problems with that. One is there's no guarantee the shift will still be there by the time I get to my email. I might be out that day, I may not be on my email, maybe I'm down running a program or maybe it's just crazy busy and I'm at the reference desk constantly finding books for people and I don't have a chance to check my email. Also though, parents will try to email for their teens. I was very surprised at the number of emails I would get about shifts that had very correct grammar and punctuation when the rest of the time that same teen would email me and it would be all lowercase, no punctuation, you know, lots of slang, you instead of the word you, and then suddenly I would get, you know, dear Chrissy, <laughs> very formal, very obvious that their parents are trying to email for them. And so I just started saying no email to sign up for shifts. And I didn't tell the teens so much that it was because of the parents thing, but I really emphasized that it was better customer service for them. I might not be there. I might not be on my email. I told them they could call or they could stop by to sign up for shifts. And they didn't have to speak with me. They could speak with any of the youth services librarians. So it helps them practice their conversation skills and their phone etiquette. That's obviously a plus. Um, but I did say, you know, even though I don't want your parents calling to sign up for shifts or to call in if you have a substitute, your parents can notify us if it's an emergency. I had one poor girl who was in the middle of an asthma attack and felt that she had to call herself in to let us know she wasn't coming. I felt really bad about that. And so I, I, after that year, I started making it a point to tell people, if you are hurt, if you are sick, if you are somehow ill or you know, otherwise indisposed, let your parents call for an emergency. That's okay. Um, but an emergency is not, my cousin invited me to the beach. An emergency is, I'm having an asthma attack. I woke up vomiting and you know we really don't want you coming to the library if you're vomiting. Appreciation is always welcome and I think that showing appreciation is key to happy volunteers because they're not getting paid. Yes, you might have contests where they get raffle prizes and things like that. But even if you don't have that available, just showing them how happy they make you and how much you appreciate their help can really make a difference. At the very least, I say make some certificates at the end of summer. And I'll tell the teens, if you complete the summer volunteer program, you get a certificate. If you don't complete For you, you are not helping to run it. And so that made it easier for me. I just set out some ice cream, set out some toppings, bowls and spoons. I mean, washing the dishes at the end was not that big of a deal. If you're not crunchy granola, you can even go ahead and buy some disposable spoons and bowls, but I preferred to wash my own at the end. 
Um, weeded party games, minute to win it type games work really well. There are all kinds of pins on Pinterest and there's an actual minute to win it website. Last I knew they still have it up and it shows videos of how to perform the different stunts and it tells you exactly what materials you would need. The teens find these things really fun. You can get out an actual sand timer or get a stopwatch if you want to or you can just play and what we ended up doing after the first couple of years where we did time it and we had everybody watching to see who could complete the different tasks we ended up after that just setting up different stations and saying okay here's a bunch of different stations set out here's a bunch of different games go around do the ones you feel like if you feel like timing it go for it if you don't who cares it doesn't matter we're here to have fun goodie bags are a fun touch and they're also a great way to get rid of some of your summer reading prizes for the little kids. I always hold my appreciation party after the kids summer reading program has ended because I want to make sure that they've had their full opportunity to finish their volunteering before I thank them and also because any stuff that was left over from summer reading could be used as goodie bag fillers and so if I have extra pencils or if I have extra tattoos you'd be surprised how excited teens are about the temporary tattoos even when they're summer reading theme they love putting them on their faces especially on their foreheads I don't know why that was but we always ended up with at least a couple of volunteers left the party with a tattoo on their forehead from summer reading as far as retaining your summer volunteers, making save the date postcards to send to former summer volunteers is an excellent idea. You can just steal the artwork from whatever you're going to be doing for summer reading, slap it onto the save the date um, template that I've got there, uh, and then just print it out. And if you change your information, you can actually scan your signature and put it on there so you don't have to sign every single one. Um, it's really it's a nice touch I send them out a month or two before the training sessions and that way the teens have plenty of time to get it on their calendar um, especially if they've done it in the past they probably know roughly when the training is and so they'll they'll feel overconfident and they'll forget to check on the website or whatever so this is one way to make sure that it's really on their radar um, you I already said scan your signature. Um, I like to write out the addresses so I can combine siblings on one card. I know it's kind of cheesy. Maybe you think each kid deserves their own. I've never had a problem where um, teens complained that I sent one card to a household, but I figure if I was printing out labels, it was going to print them all individually and I wanted to consolidate when I could. All right, so there are resources for you on that Google Drive. Sample applications for the summer volunteers. There's a rule overview that we provided on our website as the heads up. And it's basically a lot of the same information that you would have on that FAQ. Um, but they could print this out and they could bring it with them to the training and they could see, oh, okay, everything that Chrissy talked about online is everything that she's talking about here in person. So it wasn't really any kind of surprises. Um, there's a volunteer training PowerPoint. It goes through exactly how my training was last year. You can use it as a template. Um, feel free to use the entire thing and just change the pertinent information. I really don't mind. There are Google Calendar tutorials for setting up your calendar, how to duplicate shifts with minimal effort, sharing the calendar with your volunteers, and then there's also templates for volunteer documents like the FAQ to hand out after training, sample scripts for the sublist, volunteer management documents include the sign-in template, the sample shift tracker, and that is the Google document that I was talking about where you use the spreadsheet and I've got the color coded different months and things like that. Um, We've got templates for volunteer recognition. There's the Summer Volunteer Program Completion Certificate and the Volunteer Reference Letter, um, just in case you wanted to give out letters to kids who needed references for whether it was a club or a class or a college application. School Year Volunteers is a much simpler, much shorter thing, so don't worry, we're not really running out of time. Um, recruitment methods are basically the same, so you don't have to worry about going about anything differently. The work does vary quite a bit though. General craft help is what we needed most in our library. We needed people to pre-cut and pre-count things for our 
story times a lot of the time. Um, children's room maintenance is big. That is always going to be a problem, whether it's summer or school year. You've got kids coming in and playing with the puzzles and playing with the toys and not returning chairs where they belong, putting books in the wrong area. Helping your friends group and helping at book sales are great ways to get volunteers during the year. Um, and helping with special events. If you've got other departments who need help with anything, I know that we no longer, um, towards the end of my tenure at East Greenwich, we no longer had date due stamps on the cards, but if your library still does that, they could stamp those cards for your circulation department. One thing that they had a lot of fun with was shredding papers for our bookkeeper. Um, apparently a paper shredder is a lot like a video game to some teens and they just think it's hilarious and fun and the bookkeeper would rather tear her hair out so she was happy to hand that over. You could also have them folding policy folder or policy flyers for your circulation department for people getting new library cards and things like that. There is a list of tasks available on Google Drive to just give you a little bit of an overview of things that volunteers can do. Um, one of my favorites was with the puzzle collection. The kids would help put together the puzzles to make sure they had all the pieces. And some of the volunteers like, wow, I'm getting volunteer credit to put together kids' puzzles. This is really fun you will know which volunteers will find that fun and which will think that it's a stupid idea. Um, so just use your judgment when you're assigning these tasks as you go. Recruiting groups for special events is probably the most fun that I had with the school year volunteers. I loved getting the book sales set up and helpers um, because that helped to show the friends of the library who are predominantly senior citizens that teenagers are not just troublemakers and they're not just here causing mischief, they're also here helping in the next generation of library users. Um, special celebrations like Star Wars Day and Take Your Child to the library day. On Star Wars Day we had a lot of volunteers who liked to come in with their lightsabers and dress up while they were helping out with crafts. Um, take your child to the library day. We had someone cutting and serving cake. We had someone who was helping out with crafts. We had someone else who was taking pictures with the cardboard um, cutout standees of the creepy carrots. So there's lots of different ways that you can use them. We do require an application for our school year volunteers, but it's a little bit different application because they're not telling us so much, um, you know, I want to do super volunteer or super uber volunteer. It's more, do I need five hours for a class or do I want this to be an ongoing kind of thing? Again, they're available online or for pickup, but we do allow them to drop these off anytime because there's not a specific training. We just say, come into the children's room, speak with the children children's librarian, you can discuss your availability and what kinds of things you're interested in at the drop-off. We mostly do on-the-job training for that kind of thing because there's not really standardized jobs. It depends on what the job is, what you're going to ask them to do. And so we often give a quick demo, show them how to use the Ellison die cutter, show them that we would prefer for the the hand cutting to look perfect as opposed to having many of them quickly. We'd rather have it not look like the three-year-olds cut out the hearts themselves. Um, we had one volunteer who was brilliant and got into Harvard but could not cut out a paper heart to save her life. So giving her a quick demo of I need it to look like this, she was able to say I really can't do that and then we found another task that worked better for her um, and neither of us wasted our time. Now, I do have one other suggestion, but I have to give this disclaimer. I haven't tried this style of school year volunteer training, but I think it could work really well. Unfortunately, I didn't think of it until I was in my final summer of volunteers, um, but I think you could probably do monthly trainings during the school year if you wanted to come up with some standardized jobs. So you could do a standard training for paging or for craft prep or for whatever it is that you're going to need. And there's two different shift possibilities that could work really well with this. You could have them sign up for regular shifts. You know, for example, every Tuesday at 3 o'clock they come in for an hour or for two hours and they do whatever is needed. Um, or they could just sign in and complete work whenever available. That would work really well for a school library, I think, uh, where kids can come in during their study hall and they could say, okay, I have some time today because I don't have any homework. I'm going to sign in and I'm going to do my work. 
and then the two job possibilities are set jobs where you could say, for example, Lauren shelf reads and dusts in the picture books. John is responsible for in government class, they could say, Chrissy, how much time have I already got at the library? And then we could sign them up for shifts to make up the rest. Short-term volunteering is very common during the school year, especially that participation in government class. Um, all of the teens in East Greenbush need five hours per semester. Um, and religious education classes, we found there were a lot of kids that were sent in to do volunteering. Martial arts classes sent um, some younger tweens in even looking. And honor society kids are going to be applying for honor society need to have volunteer credit. Um, Please feel free to reach out if you have any questions after the fact. I know we're going to have a quick question and answer time at the end here, but if you think of anything after the fact and you really want to reach out and you know ask me questions in person or ask for more in-depth, feel free to go ahead and send librarinamama at gmail.com. Um, and that bit.ly link on the bottom there is where you can find all the materials that I discussed and a little bit more. But now we're just going to open it up to our questions. Excellent. Well, I uh, will extend the thanks of um, both myself and Nyla, as well as everyone on the call today to Chrissy, and we'll uh, end our recording right there.